just like that it is on and cracking once again welcome to that his show a story written by a current prisoner with your favorite journalist tony wow are we bringing in heat today in exclusive wow for the first time ever <laughs> after years and years jason bro of, of people hearing you speak man now they can actually see you for the first time bro jason how are you doing man Man, I'm, I'm doing, you know, I can't complain. I'm doing really, really good sitting here in this little cage. Very excited to, uh, you know, do this thing a little bit different, man. We've been rocking for a long time, so we're going to rock it in a whole different fashion tonight, bro. That's for sure, huh? All right, absolutely. This is how we're going to do this. So, so basically, you know, growing up as a skinhead and, and getting into this type of situations, you get yourself into all kinds of crazy situations because... When you consider yourself a comrade or you consider yourself a skinhead, there was a lot of people around this time who, you know, mislabeled it or didn't understand the true meaning of what it was to be a skinhead. Um, it, it wasn't just a label or a title. It was a way of life. And for me, you know, we didn't carry it lightly, especially being a penai skinhead. We were the top of the top. So you get these dudes that were very young. Hey Tony, you went off. I I see you. I see you. I just I just didn't okay. know if you wanted me right there staring at you the whole time. So it's good. It's good. I'll just keep rocking. All right. Political tattoos. You had to earn the 14s on your neck, 88s on your neck, and stuff like that. And there were certain acts that you had to do to be able to rock these political letters, political numbers, in a certain fashion to where people are going to take you seriously. And, and it was all around Southern California, everybody wanted to be a skinhead. Everybody wanted to run with that label, not realizing what that label carries. And what I mean by what that label carries is you become a frontline soldier, period. And you become a frontline soldier because that's what the term skinhead represents when you come to prison. And when you're on the streets, in order to rock your boots, rock your red laces, your suspenders, and everything that comes with it, and you're going to these white power rallies and these punk rock shows, and you get to see the authenticity of what it really is to be a skinhead or a white supremacist in California. It's a lot different in California than it is in other states. In other states, it's a little bit more traditional. In California, we're rolling around with guns. We're rolling around with bandanas, tattoos, as you can see, all across our face and stuff like that. Out there, they frown upon it. And the movement is a little bit more traditional because they're trying to keep their comrades out of prison. In California, all of our elders, including myself, I'm guilty for the same act. I was brainwashed and I was brainwashing people to make it seem that being a skinhead was about coming to prison. And it was about having hatred in your heart towards other races, predominantly the blacks, African-Americans. We didn't really know why we hated these dudes. We just decided to hate them because that's what we were told. That's what we were led to believe that these guys are not our friends. These are our enemies. And we didn't know any details about them. We never shook hands. I went years not even shaking hands with a black man just a Hispanic dude. It would be against our rules. It'd be against our politics to eat with these African-Americans, smoke after them. But it was kind of funny. We can do drugs. We can buy drugs from them. We can sell drugs to them, but we can't do all that other stuff. So all these little skinhead hate groups like Coors and uh, uh, American Front, Lads, SDSH, they started recruiting mass amounts of numbers and all these dudes wanted to become a skinheads. Then they get arrested and they come to California State Prison. And when they come to California State Prison, they find themselves in a real, real sticky situation, such as, for example, you show up into a dorm and there's about 90 something blacks because wherever you go in the state of California, it's a known fact that the white population is the minorities by a, by a long shot. You might only get 20 white boys that are on the yard. Half of them are going to fight. Half of them are not. You're going to sit there with about nine dudes that you can really rely on. And every one of them, 90 black dudes, are going to get off. So you might find yourself walking into a dorm where you have to get off on them. you got to riot. And that's when you see 
a true skinhead's heart and see the distance they're willing to go in order to rock that label. Now, it ain't so cool to be a skinhead. And being a skinhead, just like the Northerners, have a really high turnaround rate because of the politics and the pressure and the standards that you have to look up to. It's real, real brutal. That would be the best word for it. So it didn't matter whether it was a level four, level three, level two. It did not matter. Being a skinhead was a skinhead, and you had to act accordingly. And at one point, around 2006, 2005, 2007, 2008, we were running a no-hands policy among all skinheads nation in, in the state of California, statewide. It was a no-hands policy. So if we were getting off on people, it was going to be with a knife or a slicer, period, or we were going to discipline you accordingly among our own and only a skinhead can touch a skinhead just a regular white boy cannot touch a skinhead a skinhead will set trip automatically and they will rally up the comrades and they will smash on every white boy it didn't really matter so there was rules and regulations to that stuff which takes me back to chuck the wallace state prison to a few comrades of mine that i knew one of them's name was dozer who happened to be my old celly another one skateboard and crackers and they were down there in chuckawalla in a level two setting to where politics aren't supposed to be so rough they're supposed to be a little bit more light duty but see in prison you never know how things are going to play out a lot of these dudes going inside these missions their heart starts pumping you're getting ready to hurt somebody really really bad and like i said skinheads we have to look up to a certain standard so you're not going to catch not one skinhead in the state of California who's going to put in some work and not be proud of it. So they're going to make sure that whatever mission they're going on is going to be outstanding so that when they get to wherever they go and their reputation is circulating among other skinheads, they want them to be looked at a certain way. It's all about reputation. It's all just an egotistical, sadistic type of game, really. And everything was all distorted. Everything, this has nothing to do with national socialism. It has nothing to do with being a Nazi. Everybody gets that real misconstrued because a skinhead is different than being a Nazi. A white supremacist is different. Everything is categorized differently with different rules, different ways of life. But just being a skinhead, you have to have that hate in your heart. So these dudes were down there and something came up or an individual needed to get hurt. There was rumors going around that this dude was a person. Not only that, there was rumors going around that he was dating someone of another race. It was an African American. And number one rule is that's completely unacceptable. You will be lucky to even survive a hit you will be lucky to survive a hit if you become a race traitor. And that's what the comrades are going to label you as. They're going to label you as a race traitor because that is a, now you are deemed an enemy of all comrades and your name will be circulated among all comrades and you are going to be banished from the society and the movement of white supremacy. Hey, Tony, we're going to have to, we have, 30 seconds left, I'm going to have to uh, re-hit you up and do the last 15, all right? So, you know, the, the last thing you want is to become an enemy of your own movement. That's the last thing that you want. So, immediately off the top, these dudes are going to target you, and that's exactly what my comrades did. They ended up targeting them. And the way that they did this is they're going to find an individual, who's usually the leader, and it was going to take leadership and how they're going to get the job done. Okay, so when you become a race traitor, that's when that's when the hatred starts pumping through someone's heart. That, that's when that hatred really, really starts riling up every soldier and skinhead right there on the guard because they're going to start stimulating that one, and they're going to be like, "Get that race traitor!" And it's like a spit in our face. It's like worse than being an African American. So kill that dude. That's what's going to come out of every dude first. Kill that dude because he's a parasite and he's not worthy. And what would Hitler do? And this is the way that people would talk, bro. What would Hitler do? Me personally, I've never worshipped Hitler because I never really was fond of the research and studies that I did. But hey, I was a skinhead, so I rolled with it. I worshipped the movement. He was just a symbol of the movement for me. 
I had the hatred in my heart, but I, my hatred was just from me being stupid and lost in prison, and I was mad at myself. But these guys right here it was the wrong ones to pick up the job for that dude, so they picked up the job quick. And my boy Dozer, he ain't no joke. That dude is just as lethal as anybody. So what they did was is they ended up getting together, him and two other boys, and they decided how they were going to do it. And one of them was going to slice one of them, and then they were just going to get rid of the, the weapon and then just start beating him down until the cops show up. They're just going to beat him down until they get sprayed as a normal m mission would do. But as long as you get rid of the piece, usually nine times out of ten, they're not going to get you for the actual murder or attempted murder because they don't have the weapon. So the way it usually goes down is you're going to have somebody who's going to – his only position is going to be to just grab the weapon, take it, dispose of it, never be found again. They don't have the evidence, and so now they can't prove whether or not these dudes – are the ones who actually put the, the weapon on that dude's flesh. So, hello? Yes, sir. Okay, all right, it was like turning off. It was like turning off or something. All right, let me keep rocking then. Yes, sir. So basically, this is how it goes down. So I'm not gonna tell you which one of the three is the one that had the slicer, but one of them did. And this case right here went south for these guys these guys were not doing life in prison they were on a level two just doing short terms until this mission occurred but see when you become one of these gangs you become a part of this hate group or whatever you're trying to be in your aspirations you put your whole heart into it and back then things were a little bit different it really felt like we were fighting for a cause but the cause was an illusion but these dudes are heavy hitters on a level two just happened to be on a level two and god have mercy on this boys so my boy is one of them he is more of the type of person who likes using weapons because there's a, some dudes that don't like to use weapons stabbing somebody slicing somebody it just it's not for everyone okay so if there's somebody who gets pleasure out of doing it then they're going to do it so one of them boys took hands of the weapons and they decided to get it done. And the way that they decided to get it done was is they were going to catch this dude slipping at day room, and they were going to try and attempt to pull him inside a cell and do it inside a cell so that nobody can see them, and they can all just handle their business and then get out of the cell, close it, however, and everybody makes an escape. But sometimes in prison... It doesn't happen that way. Plans don't always go as planned. So what happened was is these dudes just started drinking alcohol one day. And everybody knows that when you sip Pruno, things don't go as planned. And people get riled up real quick. That's why me personally, I don't even mess with Pruno. As a matter of fact, I don't even drink alcohol at all. But sure the heck not no Pruno because it makes people rage. It makes people violent and it makes them do stuff that they wouldn't normally do. So these dudes started sipping Pruno and decided, hey, the dude's right there. Let's just go ahead and handle it right now. And they, oi, oi, which means fight. Oi, oi, they say to each other, let's get this dude, comrade. And they get up. Oh, right, bro. And they get up and they walk over to the dude. And this dude right there, who's the victim, he has no idea that anybody knows his business. And usually down on the minimal yards, certain things are overlooked. So you don't usually get politicked on on the level two yard for dating another race. It's not usually that serious. However, you get people that are white power down there, and it's just the wrong people, wrong time for your boy. And so he was over there oblivious to what was going on. They just roll up on him like some serious goons and hit him. And the person, my bro, is the one who hits him. And he hits him and he cut him on his throat. When they hit him on his throat, the dude immediately goes and grabs him to his neck. And big old, there's two of my boys, crackers and skateboards. They're big dudes. And they just serve him. He's immediately on the ground. And they start stomping this dude. Turns into a three-on-one. They ditch the piece. They ditch the piece. The weapon is completely disposed of, and they're beating this guy, and they're going and going and going until the cops get sprayed. 
when you're in these kind of situations, you don't even realize how bad it's really getting. You just start going, and you're not paying attention to whether the dude is listening. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Whether he's still breathing or not. So they were just pumping on this dude. The cops come in, and they spray them, hit them with the batons, and they secure them. But remember, they're drunk. So they're not noticing how bad the damage is, and they're screaming, oi, oi, that's why I call, man, and all these other obscenities to the to each other, like, yeah, we did that. We just accomplished that mission because all they care about is for the comrades to be proud of what they did until everything unfolded. And what happened was is the dude didn't wake up. He ended up having concussions, severe, fatal concussions to his head, and he died. Next thing you know, these dudes are in the hole for murder. They were doing like 16 years with half, two years with half, three years with half, and now they're in the hole for murder. Then the DA, the Riverside courts, pick it up, a murder. Now it's going straight to the counties, and they get transferred from Chuckawalla Hole to the county, facing murder, life sentence all three of them. And what happens is the older one who decided to feel responsible for what happened took the rap off their hands for his little comrades to get a better deal. And that's what happened. So he, he ended up signing for an extensive time so that the other ones can get decent sentences. And that's what happened. But let me tell you something. Coming in on a 16 with half and then ended up turning that into another 10 years, into a decade, that's what, the, that's what people were willing to do back then. But see, my point of this message is, is that's what people thought it was to be a skinhead. That's what people were brainwashed to believe that you had to do in order to be cool, in order to have credibility, in order to be high-fived, sieg howled, to be accepted. That's what they thought. And in my opinion, well, that's not the way to think. You don't want to be that. And there ain't no love and there ain't no real comrade because comrade is translated into brother in arms. Because if you're real brother in arms, you try to keep yourself out of trouble and not get yourself into trouble. And you don't hate people just for the color of their skin. You don't have you don't want to have hate in your heart for anybody unless they do you wrong. That's on you. But to hate somebody for the color of their skin, that's something that's complete completely unacceptable in my opinion. So thank you for everybody who's watching it. I hope you enjoyed another hit that we just produced. <laughs> hey Tony. Hey, this one was a banger.